tuning in. Welcome everyone to Fireside Chats, sales partnering with large corporates. I'm Nisha Shridhar, Marketing and Events Manager at Foresight Canada. It's great to see you all here today. It's with gratitude and respect that we acknowledge the lands on which Foresight operates um, are the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And for myself, I'm speaking to you from Calgary, which is within the Treaty 7 territory. These are the traditional lands of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, Kenai, Pekani First Nations, the Satina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda First Nation. Here is the agenda for the day. We have an experienced panel here and our very own James Shapea, EIR, who will be moderating the session. Before we start, I want to say a few words about Foresight. Foresight is Canada's clean tech accelerator, and our goal is to make Canada the first G7 country to reach net zero. We work tirelessly to position Canada as a global leader in clean technology. We bring together clean tech innovators, industry partners, investors, government, and academia to address today's most urgent climate issues and support a global transition to a green economy. Here is our panel, George, Rob, Rob, George Robin, sorry, Suki Daka, Colin McQuinney, and James Shapaya, who will be moderating the session. Um, we can start with our introductions. Over to you, George. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, so just a quick intro to myself. Uh, my, um, my, my, my current role is uh, Chief Commercial Officer at the company called Loop Energy. Uh, we make hydrogen fuel cells. So um, as a as a business, we are a component supplier to OEMs that manufacture vehicles uh, or power generation equipment. Um, so from, from that perspective and kind of tying it a little bit to the topic of the webinar, um, my, my role is I, I run the global sales marketing organization, uh, uh, product product management and global service. Uh, and we have a range of customers and partners from, you know, small startups all the way to multinational companies. Um, I've been in same or similar roles for about 20 years uh, in renewable energy space and in photovoltaic, uh, in prop tech, uh, like building materials, um, as well as some of the uh, like microelectronics type situations. So kind of had a had a fortunate situation to look at the at the sales cycles from uh, from different perspectives in different industries. Okay, thank you, George. Um, Suki. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today on Foresight. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you folks. In my current role, I'm the Executive Vice President for Portable Electric, looking after the revenue side of the business that includes sales, marketing, and partnerships. Similar to uh, George, I've been in this role in various organizations for the last 20 years. I've worked for Fortune 1000, you know, companies like SAP, uh, software oriented, right down to free revenue startups. And I'm happy to be here and happy to engage and answer and help in any way I can. Thank you, Suki. Um, now, next up is Colin McQuinney. Thanks. Um, good morning. And uh, yeah, thanks to Foresight for uh, organizing this. Um, I'm one of those weird guys that uh, enjoy sales. <laughs> and, uh, so since I graduated from Western many years ago, I was uh, sort of followed a path of sales rep, account manager, sales manager, uh, VP of sales in charge of about 150 salespeople, and then started my own firm actually during the dot-com days in the late 90s. And fast forward, I'm now uh, owner of two firms. One is Canada Startup, another is Sales Primer, uh, primarily focused on helping companies actually put together a B2B sales process that sells. And uh, this topic is actually uh, one that I deal with with clients a lot, uh, actually, is um, the challenge um, and the best practices of how to get into large corporate clients and how to accelerate that sales cycle. So Looking forward to talking to about it today. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. And over to James, um, and he will also moderate the session. Uh, thanks, Nisha. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you guys for joining us today. 
um, as a one uh, one measure just as uh, to help this along. As for those that are joining us, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q and A section. Um, there is the chat there, but if you do Q and A, then it's easier for our guys to actually uh, monitor and provide responses either directly or they can uh, talk to you about the specific questions you have. This is a topic that I have wanted to to address because it's such a big deal about how do you move the ball forward as an early stage company and the, what are the pros and cons of working with those those large corporates? There's been books written about working with uh, selling to the whales and how do you do this and and how do you do it effectively because it can be so time consuming. My background is is different. I'm not one of the sales guys. I am actually a finance guy. But that said, um, I have when I've been involved historically in working with companies and financing those companies. This is a big deal because it has the chance to either make or break a company. It can provide you market access, but it can also uh, you burn up through a lot of capital or choke you off and then get you shut down. And so those can be challenges where those companies are actually just looking at you to try and take over your technology. So that's some of the things that we want to try and cover today. I'm really looking forward to our guys' thoughts and with respect to this. Maybe I could throw it out there and say, okay, the as a startup, your timeframes are really, or early stage company, you really try and move a lot faster. Now those large corporates have their own timetables and they tend they can be very different. Um how do you actually break in? How do you best get access and into those companies and where do you get into because you know as everybody that anybody has worked with me I, I have my two questions what's the problem you're solving and who owns the problem and and if you can't identify who owns the problem in those companies then you're not able to address it so how do you work your way through those companies um james will have happy to Happy to kick kick it off. I'm sure there will be lots of uh, lots of experiences and, and views shared on this. To, to be honest, like I, I would actually maybe take one step back and and first start from well, like what are you actually trying to get out of it as a business, right? Because that to an extent will determine where do you go within this organization. And it's like I mean, some of these companies are like like governments, right? I mean, like it's just a massive structure and uh you just because you entered in one part of it it does not mean that you'll be successful in the other uh quite frequently especially with a lot of small companies what happens is you may be able to enter into sort of like this you know the, this pilot or a, or a, or an r d or development sort of a side of the organization that is not necessarily directly coupled into the purchasing office that is you know dealing with you know procuring the types of things you're hoping to supply and you may have traction within the r d pool you may not get the traction at this stage of development with the purchasing office for instance but maybe you don't necessarily want that maybe if you if you're after like a big brand name you know validation sort of engagement that helps you from the overall positioning of the company that may be enough if you after actual sales distribution that may not be the right path so i would start from defining what are you trying to accomplish by engaging these partners hey, colin thoughts on that because i actually tend to agree that and the, the challenge is on these large corporates you've got that's multi-layers so how do you work your way through and find where you want, so define it, but how do you work, manage that process of getting in there? Yeah, it was a great point by George. And I think, you know, one of just this sort of piggyback on his point, if you just want the logo, for instance, it might just be enough to do a pilot for it for them and do a bit of a case study for it. And you can, you know, leverage off that then. 
Um, if you absolutely want to expand actually what you're doing with the firm, then it's a little bit more complicated. And exactly for what George said is that, you know, often actually the person, the department that you're solving the problem for um, does not, is not communicating to purchasing, for instance, on why they need this. And often you need to write a business case ultimately for them to be able to actually approach, like sell, sell it internally, ultimately, if you can't get purchasing at the table. The one thing I'd say is um, to navigate through through this, it's great to try to find, again, we, you know, the, the word champion is often used. And the champion often is not necessarily even the decision maker, the user decision maker, for instance, for your solution. It could be somebody that just knows how to navigate basically a deal through their own internal processes. And that is an incredibly valuable person to try to uh, ident identify because they know the politics, they know the kind of case that you need to bring to purchasing. Um, and one of the things that we've started to do with clients is in your early discussions and as you're going through sort of needs analysis and that type of thing, um, ask them if they've got an example of a similar type of solution and how that was actually navigated through their process. And it gives, I find it gives actually people that you're talking to a perspective on how to think about it. And they can give you some good intelligence on the kind of steps that are needed to bring this thing through and ultimately the kind of information um, that maybe you can get ahead of the game for instance, and start providing to the right people so you can accelerate sales. It's, you know, building on that, there is, there is a question in the chat and you guys can take a look at. Is there actually, is there a standard way that you would go about trying to find those? How do you find those champions? How do you find the, the process that you need to go through with it? Because is it similar for, a lot of the companies or is there going to be is it rather unique what's uh, suki have you had a, any um any thoughts on that yeah yeah definitely um i think it's really understanding your product or service and how you fit into the organization's product or service to bring them value right if you can understand the value you're going to bring them in the roi or the potential return they're going to make or the cost saving uh then finding who that's important to within that organization. And that would be your first area to approach for me anyways. We typically use the value-based approach. We look for the part of the organization that's gonna adopt this or accept it. I suppose sustainability folks are, they're really good to talk to, but they're rarely the ones that are gonna sign the check, but they're good for getting proof points and learning about the organization. And you know, we worked uh, in this role, we work with um, Netflix or the Amazons of the world quite a bit. And they have great sustainability teams. But when it actually comes to signing the check, we find ourselves in a completely different part of the organization. We may have started in A. They get us a good understanding because they're champions for this cause, but they're not the ones that are gonna write the check for the cause. So getting those early stage champions on where you have an impact on their lives, that's where we aim first. And that's what I would recommend is find out who you're going to impact in their lives in a good way that they want to bring you into the org. How do you, so for somebody like that, so you're going into these large corporates, uh, there's, there's real risk to, for them to engage with an earlier stage company. And, and they understand that. And so, you know, whether you could have a really good solution is one thing, but whether you could actually meet their requirements and their, how do you, because, and and how do you find the different people that are involved in that? Because so you said you go through one area, but then you've got procurement, you've got all these different areas. Thoughts about a, a process that you guys have seen that's been effective in managing those things and knowing how, as an early stage company, I, I know, well, I need to go to this area, this area, this area. I need to be aware of this. What are those, and what are those uh, last part of that question would be, what are the real fatal flaws that if you're not looking at up front are probably going to so negatively impact the, your sales processes that it could not 
may not actually work. Thoughts? Or is that too loaded? Two things that are just <laughs> that come come to mind for me is again, if you can understand their buying process and reverse engineer that a little bit, um, I really instead of waiting to the end I'll ultimately to try to navigate that, we're really re recommending that or even early stage in the sales process you try to get an understanding of what their buying process is. Um, but the other thing is, and getting to Su Suki's point, which was a great point of a value, is can you in your customer discovery is there something already on in the budget ultimately? Is there an initiative that's already been funded that you can align to? Because that makes things a lot, if you can call what you're doing something similar and align it to or piggyback on something that's already been budgeted for, I find that can really accelerate and make the decision easier for the purchaser which is what we're always trying to do here, right? It's not something that's new. It's something that they see helping an initiative that's already been funded. Okay. Um, you guys mentioned uh, it throughout their piloting. Um, now, one of the problems that we often see uh, large corporates are prepared to pilot, but you could end up in those pilot purgatory where it never actually moves past the pilot is there a way in the sales process that you can actually change that pilot to say, okay, I, uh, if we hit these things, then there's a sales in, in there. Can you use the piloting to move you past the, just seeing if it actually works? Thoughts, George? I, I, I mean, look, um, so it's sort of like yes, 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 and no, right? Like you, I, I mean, I think you, 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 you can under the right circumstances, right? But this, this again, like if if there is if there is an established agenda, if there's an established project and a direction that that this large corporate is 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 following, and this kind of echoes what what I think Colin was describing, right? Like there, there's there's a program that they're executing on. And you can you can very clearly align your pilot or whatever you're doing with that program, then yes, I think there's probably ways for you to do it. And, and it's less about how you sort of would do it contractually with you know some triggers or milestones. I think that can always be figured out. It's more whether or not they have already decided to move down this path, or if there's 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 maybe not always but quite often there is there, there's a pocket of money for trying new things and developing things but it doesn't necessarily have an automatic equal sign that they get adopted and used in other parts of the organization right and i, I think it is critically important to realize whether or not that bridge exists at the early stage of the project because more often than not even that pool of pilot sort of a one-off capital is going to be far greater than the amount of resources available to an early stage company. And you can spend a lot of time and a lot of cycles in this thing just to realize that you're not going to actually break out to the other side. Okay. So, so then if your objective of this and working, so clearly defining the objective of what you're trying to achieve with a large corporate, as you've said, is the first step. You need to know what you want to get out of this. Then um, how do you best uh, engage with the large corporates and, and which? how do you find the right ones to actually work with in that? Because there's like, obviously there'll be a ton of companies out there that you can go with. Yeah, it, just because they're the largest doesn't mean, so how do you figure out which of those are the are yours and could move the needle the most for you? I would maybe just throw out one one thought and and I'm sure that you know the the rest of the panel can 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 share their experiences. I, I would say try try to find somebody for the project has to be relevant to both sides for it to actually grow roots and develop, right? And and relevance is a different thing for different companies what is relevant for a fortune 500 is like is different from what is relevant for you know a tiny startup but 
as long as whatever you're trying to do is relevant on both sides, it will grow. If it is only relevant to you and it is not relevant to the other side, you will have problems, right? And, and I, would, I would also say that for, for, for a lot of the technology companies, probably one of the top things to avoid is this preconceived notion that just because you have or you think you have the best tech in the world, it does not mean it is automatically relevant to a large company, right? Quite often they would, and quite often they would rather be second or third to market, not necessarily first. Quite often they would actually take not the best tech, but a pretty good tech that kind of checks a lot of other boxes and perhaps complements more what they're doing internally, right? So just because you have the bleeding, bleeding edge, it does not automatically give you a relevance factor in that relationship. It might, but it's not automatic. And maybe there's a couple of things I'd like to add on that. You know, I saw some questions popping up around how to move, make sure you're along the same line. One of the things we do, you know, we have some processes in place to help ensure that we're moving within the organization and not just stuck to our single champion. You know, we do an NDA as step one and everyone should do an NDA as step one because you get that signing authority exposed sometimes early because the person you may not be talking to may not have signing authority. The next thing we do is a non-binding MOU or an LOI. That gets you really much higher in the organization. So understand after the pilot, what's going to happen? So if we're successful, you know, what are your benchmarks for a successful pilot? We really go through them and try to understand the one or two or three key points that they're going to take as yes, this looks successful. Okay, great. What happens next? We need to understand that up front instead of it being an afterthought after the pilot, right? So we go through this. We make someone a, a VP level, sign it. We sign it. So we're committed together. Even though those dollars are going to exchange, at least we know what the intent of both parties is. That really helps. Uh, the other thing I think startups have to keep in mind, when you go after an enterprise account, it's an investment. Your average sales cycle is probably going to be a year plus. You're going to jump $50,000, $70,000 into this engagement. You have to be ready to make that engagement. It's not going to be fast, and it's going to cost you time and money. See, I actually like what you were just talking about because, you know, it, it makes me think about um, if you're not, if you don't set this up to succeed, then kind of by default, you probably set it up to fail. And you may get, you you may actually not even get what you were originally trying to do. So it's interesting how you define and set that up. You say, well, how do I move this forward in the organization walking through the steps? Um, there's a interesting question that comes out of this is uh, for companies, Mac, how do you know where to start? And is there a better way of like, you can, obviously you're going to, you can use cold calling, but we know how successful those things are. So how do you find out who to actually, you, like, I, I remember at one point, uh, somebody said, well, you know, you got to go talk to somebody in this organization. Well, this organization was, um, uh, it had 250,000 people in it. And I said, well, what are you doing? Like, it's like, you go into Saskatoon and you start knocking on doors. Like, what is it? Like, how do you find that right one? where you start the process. Um, so okay, Colin, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we work with companies a lot is there is, it is well worth it to put in a lot of time to pre-research companies. And one of the things we look for are trigger events. Um, so then that might be something like uh, new regulation it could be a competitor move that happens something actually in the external market etc uh to where it creates some urgency to do something for a company so there's some research there and, and we look for companies that might be affected by that because it usually lands on somebody's plate pretty quickly if that happens and certainly historically we found that that accelerates the discussion and you do know potentially who would be responsible for that or have a good idea. So that's certainly one thing that we look for is something that 
would create some ur urgency. But there's been some, I just want to share a, like a few things, certainly cold calling and emailing um, that, you know, there is a certain percentage of success there. And a lot of that depends on targeting and having a right message and just simply having the uh, time to do it. But um, a couple of things I just wanted to share. One is um, a company I'm working with right now had success getting into a large firm because they saw a job applicant or job ad by the company looking for positions to fill that was related to the solution that they had. So they called up the manager of that and said, you know, because I mean, everybody hates to recruit. It's really tough today to do that. So basically, they got in by saying, we've got a solution that can help you with that right now. And they actually got into the company ultimately and uh, basically got an initial uh, pilot that way. So there's some way that that the type of alignment, in a sense, is the company taking any action as well through research that you can align to. The last thing I'll share, just to be creative, is that another one of the firms started a podcast being a subject matter expert on the industry and started inviting, actually, executives to the podcast to talk about what they were doing and um, of targets. And ultimately, that way, they got into some of those firms as well. So... There are some creative ways of actually aligning yourself. But the last thing is, if you've got a board, if you've got advisors, if you've got connections that can actually make introductions for you, that is the inner circle that you should leverage right off the bat. Um, so that's the last thing. I'll, that's, uh, that's very, uh, I think that's critical for a startup to actually take advantage of. Okay. Um have you guys run into a situation because you, you talked earlier about um, trying to find that champion that can help you work through the organization because obviously they can help navigate. Uh, what do you do uh, and, and have you found a way to utilize, um, you, you know, you go in and it doesn't mean that originally you're going to find the right champion. How do you maybe move within the organization without getting roadblocked because somebody just shuts you down, how do you effectively manage your way through those things if you got necessary, maybe a champion that's not the right person for you? Without, obviously, you don't want to get them offside either. But uh, talk about managing your champions. Hmm. Yeah, good, great question. Great question. I think, um, you know, that becomes a challenge, right? It's a real challenge out there. How do you move? And not upset the person that brought you in and, and get to higher higher powers or different powers within the organization. One of the ways is to keep them always informed, right? Don't don't sidestep them. Look for the referral if you can. Uh, keep them informed of what you're doing in the organization. You have a conversation, try to pull them in. Keep them as a valued um, asset, right? And you just have to do that as you go along. And um, that's usually the best way we do this. Just try to keep them engaged, even though we're stepping around them, so that they're aware that you're doing this. And, and sometimes they'll bless them, sometimes they won't. But if they're not moving your agenda along, you do have to film with your own agenda. You're accountable for it. Okay. So, okay, let's just say now you've found your way into the organization. You've, you're doing something, you're, you're being evaluated. Any thoughts about how do you get that sale? How do you get to close? What are things that you do? And what are the things that you don't do that are just going to right away probably work against you? George, got any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, so maybe, maybe we'll start on the ones that you don't. Um, you, you should really try to avoid getting sucked into highly involved and very expensive like evaluation exercises that don't necessarily have a like a well-defined success milestone on the other side of it right uh, and, and you can't you can't you usually you can't avoid some some form of evaluation obviously right but uh once again you you don't want to be in a position when you are asked to sort of a tinker with a whole bunch of things it's like well if you could just change this or you know could you guys consider you know doing that 
And all of a sudden, you know, you're in this position where you have a group of, I don't know, five to 10 engineers in the entire company. And there is a department of like 10 times the number of people on the other side, and they can spin up the amount of work that is just absolutely incredible. And you're not, you're doing a lot of work, but you're not sort of moving anywhere, right? Like, so on, on some level, you don't be necessarily shy to state. Uh, you know, politely and everything else that, you know, the resources are not unlimited and that you kind of need to move down the path. And this is where things like the LOIs, MOUs, roadmaps, and so on that like that, that Suki brought up are, are very helpful because at least you can start pointing to those documents saying, this is the, these are the steps and the milestones where we agreed that we're trying to, trying to hit. Uh, because otherwise you can end up on this hamster wheel a little bit and doing a whole bunch of work without a ton of visible progress, right? Yeah, it's funny you say that because I call it the, I call it the squirrel. Uh, they, <laughs> they're very good at bringing up all of these things that just pop up and you're going, going and you need to beat them down to bring you back to, to reality. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, they know, the people on the other side of the table know that you are a small company. Right. Like, so just because at some time, sometimes you make it clear, you don't necessarily lose credibility. Right. I mean, they're not envisioning you being a general electric. Right. That's that's understood. And often, actually, they're talking to you because you've got an expertise that they don't have. Right. And so we we like to use the term trade expertise for accelerating the sales cycle. Um, be sort of like that the cadence that you use to get through and to actually encourage them to have more people at the table once they see that you've got the expertise potentially that can help them ultimately what you're doing is leveraging that to actually one get more decision makers at the table but two um, accelerate the sales process to the next step and one there's two things one is just simple sales kind of 101 is I often find our clients will do a demo, for instance, or have, but not get the um, approval for the next, not get the next meeting in the calendar. Just that, right? Just getting sort of the next step actually down pat and scheduled is such a critical thing to keep the momentum going in a sales uh, you know, the last thing you want them to do is to go, great, well, we're going to think about this and we're going to get back to you at some point. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're in this limbo of, gee, should I get back to them? I haven't heard from them in a while and that kind of thing. Um, so just that simple adding that in. And one of the things that we train companies to do in if you're doing uh, if, if you've got slides, for instance, the last slide should say next steps. So you're prompting to talk about what is the next step here. Let's schedule it. Let's get it in our uh, calendars. It makes a big difference. So I think that addresses the the methodology for how do you trade off? Like you you first step, you want to gain the the validation, the credibility inside the organization, but ultimately you're trying to get to that revenue. And by by creating that process, so what I'm I I think I'm what I'm hearing you from you guys is is that use the own the large organization's process against themselves create create a process that they're used to and so that you can move from we've now done this and you know I like so yeah, I like your point about the LOI MOUs and so forth to be able to say we just are getting this done so that we can then get to that is yep. is that correct Exactly, exactly. That's how that works, right? So your MOU might be pilot, pick these three. Okay, what's next? We're going to a budgetary committee or we're, you know, the pilot becomes uh, a purchase of X amount, right? And how it translates into the company. But the MOU will be your guiding light for how that opportunity is run. And, and on those, when you're doing the MOU, are you actually outlining who's involved? Because like, how do you bring in, you guys are right at the top, George, you're saying like there's multiple different parts of the organization. Can you use those MOUs and uh, LOIs or whatever, however, to say, this is when these different parties 
are brought in and having the large corporate understand that that's again establishing process yeah i think you try to make it as complete as you can some some companies will be great some will be so so great because it depends again on early stage company trying to show validation of their product or their technology you may not have the full picture uh yeah because for us like at Ford electric we're a brand new marketplace so people three years ago hadn't even heard of the product that we're producing so they're like okay if we can do x i can get you into the electrification side of our organization where they can definitely help grow this but before you get that entrance they want to make sure that you can do what you say you can do right so sometimes the lou is to get a proof point but now that we've been around you know our lous now are We'll show a proof point here, but then we get a commitment for the next three years on product flow, right? So they vary depending on your customer and your organization, but you try to get them as detailed and complete to an order at the end of it as you can. I'm going to move a little bit to um, the risk management and what you need to or not need to do there. And there's a story I can tell you. There's I took a was part of we took a very large energy company in to do a tour of an early stage company. Now, the funny thing is the early stage company was um, developing a fusion reactor. And in the tour, uh, the energy company looked around and was actually highlighted that, well, there's all these tripping hazards. Look at all the cables that are on the floor. And I was like, I'm looking up and I'm going, you're not even seeing what's in front of you. You're seeing this and it's just, they're so ingrained on certain things about the risk management that it can create these challenges for how you engage and how you work together in this sales process. Thoughts about, uh, and like one, one other one I have is an aerospace company realized that they were so bad at this that every company that they engaged with they actually were killing. So they had to change their process and make sure that the legal department of the large corporate stayed out of this process because it would just went so poorly. Thoughts about that part of the engagement process together, because you are going to be very different and you don't have all of the documents that they necessarily have. But just it, at the absolute minimum, be realistic with yourself and what you can and cannot do right and and it is it it's quite helpful if you can get um either from other folks that may have dealt with this company or from public documents and whatnot what would be the level of requirements that they would impose on you as a supplier or a partner for this particular type of engagement. Again, it will be it will be different depending on what you're trying to do, right? But I like you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, tripping hazards on the floor is one thing, but the other one is look, if you if you're actually going after the role of a supplier to a large organization, um, you know, I can tell you is let's say in the like in, in the world that we're in today, I can nearly guarantee you that a company over a certain size is one of the first things they're going to ask you in their RFQ process that you're going to end up in at some point is whether or not whether or not you have ISO 9001 certification right and if you don't have one the purchasing office is just not going to deal with you right they so so just be very, very realistic in the industry that you're in. There will be some things that are nice to have for this big corporates, and there are some that are going to be an absolute must to have. And if you know for a fact you don't have it, either try to sort of engage right up front if they're or, or somewhere in that early part of the process, whether or not you'll be able to navigate through it, or frankly, maybe you're barking up the wrong tree at this stage, right? And you need to actually go and cut your teeth on something a little bit smaller um, in, the, in the earlier stages. Yeah, that's a really important point. Uh, the alternative to that potentially, if you do find out that you just don't want to play in that sandbox because it's too difficult at this point, um, some of the clients that we're working with actually find strategic partners that do have all of that that can actually rep their solution as part of ultimately the uh, relationships that they already have or 
uh, or they will get. That's actually a great, great point, Colin. And I, I very specifically, again, this this automotive space is you know somewhat you know well, again not unique, but it's very exacerbated from the you know sort of certifications requirements and so on. And so if you take like Loop, for instance, uh, we tend to supply directly to the OEMs in like regional, you know, niche type markets where those are smaller size players. And we usually what is called a tier two when we're dealing with multinationals, simply because like there's almost no way for us to meet all the requirements with tier one if you're dealing with somebody the size of Daimler or Volvo or you know something like that, right? And it doesn't matter how good your product is, you're just not going to get that. So, uh, like, I like the idea of a channel like that supply to another party and work your way through. That's actually kind of interesting. There was a question: Do um, do any of you guys have? Uh, or can point the audience in the direction of what a good LOI looks like. I actually would love to see one. I, you know, the, those are things that um, does somebody have a template that is really good that can be utilized for that? Uh, think about it. And I, I can that. share one with Nisha after the call if you like, um, and then Nisha can distribute. That would be fantastic. I would love to see that. Because I think it's actually super important and it would help help the thought process. Um, what are your guys' thoughts when it comes to so you how do you decide if you should go down this path? Now like you kind of now Colin touched on maybe you could not, maybe you don't actually want to do this. Maybe you want to go a different path ultimately. Um, what is something that you guys think about when you're looking at those companies that are in face that like you, you go through and you're doing your due diligence, you're doing your research and you're trying to validate which ones you will engage with and which ones you don't. How do you do some further due diligence on these companies? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, today, um, you know, social media tends to be a very good source. You can um, track individuals, see what they're posting, what they're writing about, check the LinkedIn posts. You can look at organizations if they're at the forefront of what you're doing, or if, you know, I think Georgia Collin mentioned that they're ones that want to be second or third to market. So you can start to identify early stage um, companies that are trying to be leaders in their industry where you might have a good fit. And that's, that's what we do. We do a lot of profiling of not only the company itself, it's electrification plans. And then the individuals within it that are speaking about electrification on a public platform, because the larger companies do speak on a public platform, you can start to do a lot of investigative research before you start to do your call outs to different companies. Okay. Um, in this, I, I wonder if you could share uh, you guys' thoughts on each of you say, what are, from your perspective, what are the, so three, four, five, whatever it happens to be, best practices for an early stage company engaging with the large corporates? The one thing I would say is um, be very targeted and become an expert in their business, ultimately, as much as you can. What is their key business drivers? What's their value chain? Um, how do you fit in there? Like it's, you've got to be from the very initial conversation, incredibly specific, ultimately, I find. And uh, it may turn into something else beyond that, but um, that sort of research uh, Suki was talking about, I just find is really important and make sure that, again, from a startup point of view, you don't have a lot of resources. So ultimately, you want to make sure you're doing as much as you can to be targeting the right kinds of companies based on that and make sure that you're confident that you've got a value proposition that fits initially. So that's I think that's step one. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah I agree with. With, with that and maybe to sort of expand a little bit um, 
you're small, they're big, uh, you have limited cycles, you want to have as good of a filter as possible when you're sort of a starting this this exercise, right? And uh, uh, it, it, it's really hard to precisely define from the beginning, like all the criteria of success, right? Uh, but, you know, in mathematics, they have the sort of the concept of required conditions and sufficient conditions, right? Like you may not be able to say what's like totally sufficient, but you can usually identify things that are absolutely required, right? So you start from here is what I want to get to. Here's what I need as a company. And I, I'll, I'll make an example because it might make it sim simpler to understand. So three years ago, we launched the, our fuel cell product into the market. So back and said, okay, we want to actually put sales on like sales on the board within 12 months. That's the goal. That's what we're going for, right? So we're going to try to target certain customers. Well, what are the absolute required things that they need to have? Well, I can tell you like in our world, if they do not have, remember we're selling to companies that make vehicles, right? If they don't have an electrified vehicle platform, there is absolutely no way to launch this product in 12 months. It's just not going to happen. So anyone who doesn't have an electric vehicle already, just take them off the list. Like for the purposes of this exercise, they're not a partner, right? If they're a company that operates in the market where they need to move like hundreds of thousands of units to make the business economics work, it is probably not going to be the customer that you're going to go after because today, based on sort of a market penetration rates, you're dealing with people that want to launch products into markets that are single thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of units, right? So once again, go into the box where it may be a big company, but they have a business model that allows them to play in that space. And, uh, you know, like James in the, in the finance world, right? There's no point going to Goldman Sachs and asking them to raise you $2 million, right? Like, it's just not going to happen. They don't, they don't have a business model to do this, right? Even though they're a fantastic brand name and a fantastic company. So if you can kind of be very clear, here's my objective. Here is a screen. I'm going to just take away a bunch of stuff that doesn't fit. Then it will at least narrow down the universe and increase your success chances. And then you enter into your, into your engagement cycle. Okay. So can you yeah, and that's that customer discovery process at the beginning. The one thing we're working with companies on a lot right now, they're going after big firms is your qualification process. Um, at the beginning needs to be ruthless for you, right? Because the problem often is not they don't have enough prospects, it's that they're writing too many proposals uh, for the wrong firms and taking up all the resources to do that to where if that the front end and throughout the sales process, they've got, you know, what we call kind of a qualification scoreboard, right? Is ultimately based on certainly things George was talking about, very industry specific things, but also from a sales point of view, do we have the right level of contact? Is the time, is the urgency there? Like that customer discovery process and understanding that starts getting you to focus more on the opportunities you should be focused on and maybe the ones you put on the back burner at this point. Suki? Yeah, no, those are all good points. And, you know, understanding your fit and everything, that works great. But find a part I find Canadian organizations, and I'm born and raised in Vancouver, so I'm Canadian, and try to shift your attitude is, you know, we tend to be timid and we tend to be shy as Canadians and we're not bold and intimidating like our neighbors to the south, right? Belief in your organization, belief in your offering, belief in try, being able to do what you can't see today. You got to walk into the boardroom of a Fortune 100 and have them believe that. And they'll only believe it if you believe it yourself. So be bold, don't be intimidated, and don't set your own limits because we can do far better. And that's where I find a lot of young companies to put the feeling on themselves. And that really hurts. And first joining here at Port Electric, we, we had a ceiling and we got a large order from uh, a utility in California that was 5X of what we thought our ceiling was. We did it. The volume, we did 2X of that order and we did it. Uh, you know, 
let's not set our own ceilings. And we tend to do that as small companies or even as Canadians. Yeah, I, I hear you on that in a big way. And that, that's actually one of the challenges for the early stage companies when they're raising capital, because those ceilings that you're talking to are the what holds back investment capital because we're selling ourselves short about what we can actually do. And that's a, yeah. that is the, the risk side. Speaking of risks, though, um, obviously working with the uh, with large corporates, what have been the uh, things that we are surprised about or you ran into that were um, potentially really damaging to the organization that you're with that you you didn't realize that that could happen and and how do you manage those things? So just a thought on on key risks. Yeah, one of the things that I find. Anyways, the customers we deal with, they could all probably do what we're doing. It'll take them no time to stand up a 100-person engineering firm, throw $10 million, $20 million at it, and replicate, right? Uh, that's a risk, right? You start to open up your kimono and start to share your roadmap and your visions, and that's a major risk. The, the advantage we have as a startup is we're nimble. We know that multi-billion dollar organization isn't going to turn on a dime and shift as the market changes. Early stage markets are going to change many different directions before they start to settle down to a mature market. Being a small organization, that's what we bring to them. And we actually had some partners say, look, if we tried to do this, yeah, we can do it. It'll take us four years. You guys can do it in six months. So we'll invest in you in a partnership or product um, because you can do it faster than we can. It's not that we can do it much different because you know, eventually they can get there. But that's always the risk you run is they, you go to these larger organizations and you start to share details with them, which you have to because they got to believe in you. They, they can invest into that market and do it themselves. That's always the risk. But one, you have to be willing to take. And again, just be bold and be out there and know that you're going to be ahead of them, even if they do. I mean, that's touch that on a minute, but I'd like to hear from the other guys first about on the risk side. Well, I... Sorry, go ahead. Paul. Go ahead, George. No, you first. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the real shocker for a lot of startups is they mm -hmm. they have a fantastic sort of sales process with a with a company, and they are incredibly encouraged by it. They think this deal is going to close any time, and then the big company sort of politics gets involved again. And it delays and delays, but they were counting on it. They stopped doing their prospecting because they thought this thing was going to close. Never stop prospecting because ultimately, regardless of how good your sales process is and how well you're aligned, their timeline is their timeline and you can only affect it so much. So always have other prospects in. Um, too much business can be, you know, is a problem that can be solved. Um uh, ultimately, again, I just that's my thing is is I see discouragement on a lot of founders because of that. There is why hasn't this thing gone through? Um, and ultimately, again, you've got to keep the wheels going and keep prospecting, and because they'll start to drop on their own time. Fair enough. George, I, I agreed with 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 both of the points that are made, and and to to expand a little bit, I on, on what Colin brought up in particular. Be very, 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 very careful in things like exclusivities or those types of setups. Because one of the things that can happen is when you and, and more often than not, as small companies, we tend to we tend to to look at engagements with a large partner as a validation to what we do, right? It validates that the product is relevant to the market, validates the technology works. More often than not, the companies will try to leverage it then to raise capital because let's face it, chances are they're probably in that mode at some stage, right? And this can, if if this relationship is not following through and not growing for whatever reason, which can happen for completely unrelated reasons to be in the product and the tech, it can backfire very, very quickly where people would actually look and say, like, oh. So that means there's something wrong with what you are doing. And, and you really don't want to paint yourself into that corner. And, and it can happen with 
exclusive arrangements, it quite often, and I've seen it happen a number of times where folks would um, sort of like accept strategic investments, right? And they would do this sort of like, yes, there is an equity investment, but it comes with a business side of the agreement. And we gave some territory and whatnot for that. Well, more often than not, the strategic guys are not really looking at your equity the way the investors are going to look at it, right? Like they're actually, so basically they just paid for the rights to a market and the shares are kind of a gravy. Yeah. And then they just, all of a sudden, they just decide to sit on it because their timelines and their relevance is very, very different. All of a sudden it's like, oh, well, he's not really doing anything with it. Clearly they are the experts in the space. That means there is something wrong with you and that becomes a hindering issue for other situations, right? George, you're so right. And it's actually something that a lot of early stage, they think that they are getting in, into a relationship with those large corporates, which is a really good thing. And to your point, they may even invest in you, but that investment is never going to move the needle on their returns. Correct. And, and you're right, where if they, for whatever reason, decide to sit on or abandon or whatever, then they they could literally buy you out of bankruptcy because by the way you're not raising any more money so you're done and they may love the technology so much that it's a clean way for them to do it so and and large corporates have been known to do it well, whether they're doing it on purpose or not I'm never going to say but uh, that is such a huge risk that you have to be prepared to manage so exclusivity is a bad thing those uh, having them on. Uh, where you don't have a balance of power for, for with others, where you've shut down somebody else working together. And yeah, Colin, you're right. Like the pipelines, the these prospect pipelines are are very leaky. There's there's things that just fall out and they don't make it to the end. So if you're not continually pushing things into that, it's just not going to work. So there's a lot of benefits to working with these large corporates because they can provide you market access, they can provide you product validation. And I do thank you guys for the time that you've spent with us and shared uh, thoughts. It's hugely important for all, all of us to be able to work with the enterprise customers as well as the other ones. So just managing those risks has been very, uh, uh, I've really enjoyed your thoughts on that. I think we're coming to time. Uh, got two minutes, one last thought from each of you in dealing with this, and then we're going to have to bid adieu. Colin, I'll just start say, with you. Oh, please, sorry, I keep Colin. wiping up. <laughs> Is there, Colin, go ahead. Sure. The, the last thing I'd say, I, what is becoming actually from a sales point of view, really important, I find, is, you know, often the solutions you're introducing introduce change management as well. Um, so you actually, not just the solution you've got, but as part of the solution that you've thought through, actually, the implementation, the onboarding, uh, their employees, actually, and you've actually, you act, you communicate a seamless process to do that and have thought through that, I find actually being a real distinction actually with a lot of firms. It's it's making the difference in a sales process and uh, can really separate you from the competition. So just wanted to mention that we're seeing that being a big deal these days. Thank you. Uh, George. Um, my, 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 I guess my, my kind of parting, parting advice would be uh, uh, big corporates can be very very valuable um it is you know they, they can make a huge difference but be absolutely true to yourself from the very beginning what are you trying to get out of it and what are they what, like can you actually do it is this there's a right time to engage with them and there's a wrong time to engage with them is this the right part of your cycle? Do you, do you actually meet some of the key requirements that they know they're going to ask you? Just because they didn't ask you in the first meeting, it doesn't mean they won't. So just be honest with yourself because you want to spend your cycles and your resources on things that move you forward, not the ones that look nice and shiny but don't get you there, right? And then you you will be successful. Thank you. It's okay. Last words. Yeah, I think I just want to resonate a little bit on what George said. The um, cycles are important, right? Large organizations, large cycles, they take time, they take money, and they may go nowhere. 
make sure that you are filling your basket with large and short cycle business. So you do have run rate business that keeps you functioning, keeps your product moving, keeps your R&D moving. And then if you land a big one, that's that's fantastic, but don't rely on it solely. Uh, it, it's high risk. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Much appreciate your time. Uh, Nisha, back to you. Yes, thank you everybody. I thank you for joining us and thank you to our panel members too. Please note our next session is on April 18th, fundraising financial venture capital versus corporate venture capital. Thank you and see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.